word penetrate our hearts, our minds, our souls. God, let us go back to that first love. Let us love your word, Lord. God, because we know that your word washes us and cleanses us. And God, you've been talking to our hearts, especially us, us men, Lord. And I pray that you continually talk to us because in the hour that we're living in, our children and our wives need to see a man of God. And I pray that you touch us today as we study this word. And everybody say amen. amen. God bless you. May be seated. We've been talking to the men about a godly man, what a godly man is, the need of a godly man. And uh, we were talking about how important it is. Now I started talking to you men about these five unavoidable absolutes. There's five uh, undeniable facts that come to visit all of us uh, at different times in our lives. That's really important that y'all listen to me because I'm going to try to help you. It's going to save you from getting bitter. It's going to save you from quitting, giving up, backsliding. If you ever are able to handle these five absolutes in your life. And the only way you can do that is if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we're talking about that then because the Bible said that in the last days, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. It says there's going to be a great falling away. That means people are going to push themselves away from this truth. They're going to follow, follow a lie. And so I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to live for God for all these years and then throw it away. Amen. I don't want you to believe a lie and be damned, as the Bible says. Amen. So these five unavoidable absolutes, I'm just going to go over them and use some scriptures and show you how unavoidable, unavoidable they are. Now, you've got to learn how to handle these. You've got to learn how to say yes to them. When they come, you just got to accept it. You've got to give it to God and move forward. If you don't, you're going to find yourself getting bitter. You're going to find yourself getting stressed. You're going to find yourself getting uh, tore up and worrying and fretting all the time. You're going to uh, end up losing your relationship with your wife or your husband. You're going to uh, lose your children because they're going to see that there's something wrong that, that doesn't ring true. Amen? So I want to talk to you men about these five undeniable facts that come to visit all of us many times over. Number one that I talked about already, but we're going to just go, go through it real quick is everything changes and ends. You need to write that down. The first unavoidable uh, fact of life is that everything changes and ends. Everything changes and ends. You don't wear the same clothes you wore when you were 12 years old. You have to change. Everything changes, but everything also ends. Uh, John the Baptist uh, in Matthew, if you give me these scriptures, I didn't give you these scriptures earlier. Uh, Matthew 11, 2 through 6, I want you to look at these scriptures with me. Talking about John the Baptist. Now we're talking about the first unavoidable absolute. Everything changes and ends. So let's take a look at it. Now when John had heard in prison, this is Matthew 11, 2 through 6. Now uh, when John had heard in the prison the works of Jesus Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So here's John the Baptist. He's having revival. He comes out of the wilderness. He's baptized. The whole city comes out. Even the king comes out to see what's going on. And he's baptizing them. He's having revival. Everything's going good. He points his finger at the king's face and says, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He's calling people to repentance. People are getting in the water, repenting, getting baptized. And guess what happens, friend? It comes to an end. Things change. Now we see in Matthew, he's in prison. And all of a sudden, he's pacing the floor. He's wringing his hands. He said, man, I, I know that I'm the forerunner. And I know that the scripture testified to me in Isaiah chapter 40. And he said, I also know that it said that he's come to set those that are in prison free. And here I am in prison, and I'm not being set free. Boy, it changed, didn't it? Yes, sir. His preaching and revival came to an end, didn't it? Yes, sir. So let's see what happens. So, and he said to him, Mark, he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again the things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Now notice what he said. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So Jesus sent him a message that said, Listen, John. Everything changes and everything ends. I know he was in a difficult place. I'm trying to show you that John the Baptist was preaching and having revival, but now he's in prison. So you better get used to the fact, church, that things are going to come to an end. Things are going to change. That's just a part of life. There's nothing you can do about it. That is an absolute. And if you can't say yes to these absolutes, you will find yourself.
yourself in trouble. You're going to find yourself getting mad and blaming God and wondering why God's doing this. And it's just a fact that everything changes and ends. So he said, don't be offended in me. And we see that John the Baptist didn't get offended because a multitude came to Jesus after he was uh, beheaded. A multitude came to Jesus said, John did no miracle, but everything that John said about you, Jesus, was true. Amen. You see, John had to come to the place where he was willing to accept the fact that, yes, things have changed. I'm no longer the key person. I'm no longer baptizing in the River Jordan. And things had to come to an end. Yes, he's going to die. And he knew he was going to die, and he could have got bitter, he could have got upset, but he was able to say yes to that absolute, that things change and things come to an end. And when he was able to say yes to this absolute in his life, he didn't get bitter, he didn't get mad, he just kept telling people about who Jesus was, pointing them to Jesus, and when a multitude came to Jesus, a multitude came to Jesus. He never raised the axe head to float out of the water. He never raised the dead person up. He never performed a miracle. But he did raise the conscience of a dead nation. Amen. All because he was able to say yes to this absolute that comes to our life. I've got news for you. In your life, living for God, there's going to seem to be some things that change and come to an end. And you better learn how to accept it so that you don't get upset, but just say, you know what, God? I don't know what you have in store for me. John the Baptist didn't know what he had, but Jesus said, you make sure you don't get offended with me. Bless the man who's not offended with me. I've been in this thing for 35 years uh, from April 9th, and I would not trade this for anything. You know why? Because I've learned how to accept absolutes. I learned how to accept these five absolutes, this first when everything changes and everything ends. There's been times in my life where God has changed the direction of my ministry and I didn't get mad. I didn't get bit out of shape. I didn't throw in the towel. I didn't quit because I didn't get in my way. I said yes and kept moving on. I never look back. I don't look back. I don't, I don't look back. Oh, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. What's in the past is in the past. Remember that scripture I quote? That the tree falls to the north, the south, and the west. There it lays. What, I'm going to go back and move it because I didn't want it to fall to the south? <laughs> what good is it to move it? It's already failed. Amen? Right. Learn how to say yes to those things that change at the end of your life. The second thing is things don't always go according to plan. Bless your heart. If you think you've planned out your life, I don't know how many people I've seen these young girls going to get married, and they plan their wedding out. And it don't ever go according to plan. Something always happens. Even if it's just pulling that, that white piece of paper, she's going to walk, I'll watch them pull that, watch them get hung up and snagged, twisted, and somebody got to run back over there and smooth it out. And, 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 and nothing's going to ever go according to plan. My little boy Ryan, when he was six years old, he was in a, a, a wedding. And, and when we went to that wedding, it was about 65 miles from where Houston was in Texas. And the girl went and tried to dress on, got it. And that Saturday morning, right before uh, the wedding, we heard the scream, this girl scream. <laughs> She's screaming and crying. And she went to the store. She tried on her dress. The girl boxed her dress up and gave her the wrong dress. And they're closed on Saturday. And guess what? Things didn't go according to plan. And bless her heart, man, she was crying, swallowed and falling. It was about three sizes too small. It wasn't going to go on. And so somebody knew somebody that had a dress shop there in the, in the Beaumont area, and they called him, and that lady went and opened up, and they found a dress that was just one size too small. And they told her, Suck it in, breathe in, and eat it. They put it all there out there, and they pulled it on up. She walked down there, and she had the prettiest purple hue. And the lot should be going to her brain. And you know what? Things didn't go according to plan. But you know, they've been married for 30 years now. They're pastors. They're doing wonderful but you know, she had to accept it. And she, what was she going to do? Cancel the wedding? Get mad? 
quit. Tell him I'm not getting married because he didn't. Listen, things don't always go according to plan. You hear what I'm saying? I was preaching the Bible. I wasn't in church very long, but I was booked up for two years, man. I was preaching out every weekend. And I was making money. They bought me a van. One church bought me a van. Another pastor with got me these Louis Rolfe suits. Y'all don't know what that is. Back then, they had no cuffs on the street, man. They were high dollar. And Stacy Adams shoes and CM ties. I didn't even know what that stuff was, but they were decking me out, man. Everything was going according to plan. And I got to Tom Foster's church and we were in revival. And we had like 30 get the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden I started coughing up blood and, and, and man, coughing it up. Coughing, had to go to the hospital. And they said, well, what did you do to your throat, man? You damaged your throat. Well, when I was in the world, I smoked hash. And I just sucked fire down into your throat. And it just it, it messed my vocal cords and my voice locks up. And here I was evangelizing, booked up for two years, man. And now the doctor said, you might not ever speak a most of this. You, you, you're not going to be able to uh, go with it. But you know what? I had to come to the place where I had to accept the fact that things don't always work out according to the plan. I didn't get mad at God and quit church. I didn't get mad at God and, and, and give up the ministry. See, things don't always go according to plan. Never made your life after that. You, you might my voice won't hold up. I can't do three, four nights in a row. My voice just won't hold. So I can get upset. But you got to come to that. That's another absolute in life. Things don't always go according to plan. Get used to it. I don't care. It's okay to plan. Don't worry about it. But if you've been planning, man, and, and I love it, man. People got all these financial planners, and they got up. And then when this last big old crunch hit, they, they, they lost, and they're scraping to get back up to where they were. And we bought these houses, and, and man, all of a sudden, those houses are all worth a penny, man, a dollar. And you're going, man, and you know what? Just smile. Give it to God. Things don't always go according to plan. But why lose the Holy Ghost over that? The third uh, thing is, and David was like that. David was anointed king, right? I give y'all Bible examples also, so y'all don't think I'm being carnal up here. I don't think my brother will be the Bible story. So I'll use one. David was anointed king. And man, he just thought he had it all planned out. And one day, oh, oh Saul threw a spear at him. Boing! And David lights a shut. That's what we say. If they light a shut in Texas, you gotta light a shut to get it out there. And man, get, get out of that fat. And so he ran and he was hiding. And man, things didn't go according to the plan. Mm -hmm. He was in a cave. Saul came and went and laid down right in front and fell asleep. And man, you know he could have killed Saul. I'm gonna make this work out according to plan. I, I'm the rightful king. I'm gonna take care of that. You know what? No, he just accepted the fact that that was an absolute life. Things don't always go according to plan. But he learned how to what? Wait on the Lord. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in some of your ways. In the ways that, that you can't control. All your ways. See, that's our problem. Our little ego, our self-worth, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Our self-worth gets in the way of allowing God and us acknowledging God in all our ways. And that's why we get mad when things don't work out according to the plan. Amen. So uh, David, he, he was like, but he waited on God. And God took care of him. And guess what? He became king in God's own timing. Yeah. And not only did he become king, but he's known as a man after what? God's own heart. Wow. So he not only got to be a king, but he's known as a man after God's own heart. So don't get offended when things don't go according to plan. And the next one is life is not always fair. Bless your heart. I've seen more people backslide because somebody forgot to say hello to them at church. Or they don't get to sing a special. Or they didn't get to preach a message. Or they didn't get to do this. Or they didn't get to do that. And they you know, it's not fair. Look, uh, well, you know what? That's, a, that's an unavoidable fact. Life is not fair. You better write that one down. That's why your kids have such a hard time. When you baby them and you call them all the way through their ears. You never say no to them. And you give them everything they want. Then when they get out in the real world and they can't afford it, they go, oh, 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 oh it's not fair. Bingo. 
Last one, prayer. It's not getting used to it. How would you like to be Joe? Have everything. Right. And he's sitting there and somebody says, oh, uh, your kids are all killed. No. Oh, all your cows are all killed. All your crops are burned. Everything's gone. Well, God, I, I, I'm a righteous man. I, I, uh, I did everything you told me to do. God, that's not fair. See, y'all don't hear that part of Job where the Bible said that Job said, God, if I had a spear, I'd throw at you. Why, why was he saying that? Because life's not fair. Why did I have to lose everything? Why did I have to, to lose that? And so that's what we're trying to get across to you in to understand that, that you've got to figure this out. You've got to understand that life's not always fair. And when things don't work out according to plan, don't get up and say, life's not fair. Don't let your kids hear you say that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Amen. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, when you can handle the absolutes of life, you're not going to be turned upside down every time something doesn't go wrong. You're not going to be crying about life's not fair. Number four, pain is a part of life. Pain is a part of life. Get used to it. Get 2 Corinthians up there, chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse number 19. So life, there's going to be pain in life. You're going to lose a loved one. Remember, everything has a what? Everything changes and ends. Yeah. One day, Sister Abra, one of us are going to die. And our marriage will end. That's just an accident of life. I can't stop that, so I'm not going to fret about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to enjoy the time I'm having right now on this earth. Amen. Amen. So life's not fair. Yeah. And, and, and pain is a part of life. Get used to it. Pain is a part of life. Why do you think you grieve? If you grieve, that means God says you can get through it. That's the whole purpose of grief. So that that ends and something new begins. Yeah. Oh, I know y'all looking at me like I pumped my head. <laughs> Second Corinthians, like pain is part of life. Let's look at this. Is Paul? For you suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring into you bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak this concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. How be it? Wheresoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death often. It says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I was shipwrecked, or suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I get in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmity. Wow. Paul could say yes to the absolute that pain is a part of life. He did not get side swiped by it. He wasn't blindsided. When things came at him, he learned how to trust in God. He learned how to put his faith in God. He learned how to, listen to me, husbands, listen to me, dads. You have got to come to the place that you've got to deal with pain when it comes. And the way you deal with pain is you give it to God because he's your comforter. Be careful for nothing but in everything by 
God's prayer and supplication with thanks to you. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you are in the midst of pain, and pain will come, mark it down. It's an absolute life. When pain comes, God can give you that peace that passeth all understanding. Paul knew how to say yes to the absolute that pain is a part of life. And you've got to understand that. And number five, people are not always loving and loyal at all times. And John Mark was like that. When Paul was in a bind, when Paul needed somebody to be with him, John Mark ran off. John Mark left. He wouldn't go because he complained. He wasn't ready. He, he didn't like, I don't want to do that. I don't wanna. He didn't want to make that commitment. So he leaves. And Paul's there by himself. Now, Paul needed somebody to go with him. And he said, I'm not taking you. John Mark because he quit on us the last time. And so Paul understood that, that everybody's not loyal and faithful all the time. That's an absolute. Everybody has a bad day sometime. And what do I say? The person's not the problem. The problem's the problem. When somebody's having a bad day, I just pray for them. I don't take it personally. Well, they chewed me out, man. They just tasted the sweetness of Jesus because I didn't, I didn't show no attitude. Or oh, they gnawed on me, brother Abraham. Well, I hope they tasted the sweetness of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's good. Now, it's hard for somebody to keep gnawing on you when you taste so good. Because they like bitterness, man. That's what they do. They're bitter. And they can't handle sweetness, a cup full of sweetness. No matter how hard it's going, you can only spill what? Man, when you're full of God, man, you can only spill the love of God. Because God is love. Amen. And so it's important that you understand that. People aren't always faithful. And so Paul understood that. You want me to prove it to you? You want me to prove that Paul had said yes to this absolute? Because if you read a few books later, you read where he says, Oh, by the way, send John Mark... Because he's profitable to me. Oh, wait a second. I thought, I thought Paul and him, no. Paul understood. Paul knew that people weren't going to be faithful and loyal at all times. But he didn't write him off. And when it came time, he called for John Mark. He said, you sent for him. Listen, you can't get bitter with your brothers and sisters over some little thing that happens in church. If you do, you're going to lose out with God. Because it, listen, the, the bitterness destroys the vessel that it's in. It doesn't destroy the person it's bitter against. It only destroys the vessel that it's in. And so you've got to understand that. So that's the fifth absolute life. People are not always loving and loyal. So these are the core challenges that we have to face. And our problem is too often that we live in denial of these facts. We don't want to accept these facts. And so we end up getting bitter. We end up losing out with God because of disappointment, frustration, and sorrow. And in reality, our fear of the struggle against these absolutes are the real sources of our troubles. When you don't accept them is where you get into trouble. Because you're not able to turn them over to God. You keep trying to work them out on your own. And I got news for you. You can't beat those things. They'll beat you down every time. Amen. Amen. So in addition to these five disturbing truths where we ended up last week, uh, stated above, there's also delightful absolutes. Our hopes are sometimes exceeded. Remember when I told the story about Shay Hewitt, where I accidentally ran into her mother. She was dying of cancer. Her mom said, we just want a few more days with her. And so I went and prayed God healed her completely. And she's still living for God to this day. Y'all remember that story from last week? And then the next one, miracles of healing happened. I told y'all about how I, I went in, I threw a blood clot. They went in there. Oh, you got a stage four lymph node leukemia. God healed me. God healed me. I was in isolation nine days. The doctor called Sister Gregory and said, come in. He's not going to live. He's not going to go home. Here I am. Over five years later, I'm still here. discover unique inner gifts. That's something else that happened about the unique inner gifts. Remember I wrote that poem, I read that to you about broken by revelation about how, what I went through. How many of y'all remember that poem I, I read last week? And I read that poem and it was what God gave me to help me go through that. And so so we see that part of it. Amen? And then things have a way of working out. That 
is something that you've got to understand. If you learn to say yes to those five absolutes, you'll understand that things have a way of working out. Amen. Man. You know, some of us got that Jonah spirit. We go to Nineveh. God tells us to preach and they're going to repent. When we go and preach, when they repent, we get mad. He got mad because they repented. What good is preaching if they repent? And see, that's, that's what happens to a lot of us. We don't understand that things have a way of working out. So after my bout with cancer and the miracle of healing, I was unable to continue work at the hospice that I was working at. And so, uh, Sister Draper got the job there. Amen. Wow. We thought we was going to be bankrupt, man. I couldn't work, couldn't preach. And Sister Draper gets the job. And then I go to work at Santa Rosa, but I got to go through the process. And, and they interviewed me. And one guy hated fitting costumes. And he tried to cut me down and say bad stuff. And he was telling me, I have to stop at people for your costumes. They're rude. They're hateful. They're self-righteous. Boy, he just judged me right and left. He said, they're judgmental. And the Catholic priest said, uh, uh, Mr. Abel, what do you think about that? I said, well, I've been here about 15 minutes. He's the only one that's been judging. He <laughs> <laughs> said, you got the job. <laughs> I see y'all laugh. But the qualifications to go to be a chaplain at, at, uh, at San Rosa, to be a full-time chaplain, is you have to have a master's degree. I know. You have to have four units of CPE to be a certified chaplain. I'm not. And they gave me the job. You see, the Bible's not a sense God. I, 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 I can't work anymore. What, what is this, God? I got cancer. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I know you healed me, but I can't be in those houses where they have cigarette smoke and have uh, all those dogs and cats and stuff. I just couldn't do that because uh, it, 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 it tear my immune system up. But I just put it in God's hand. I didn't get mad. I didn't get upset. Sister Ray got my job, and God opened the door and put me right in a position to where I've got insurance. Yeah, we don't pay one penny for our insurance. Sister Abraham. And I'm not even qualified. I just got to try to show you if you learn how to say yes to these absolutes, God is able to have things work out. Amen. You don't get upset. You don't start trying to fight against the reality of absolutes. It is a fact that pain is a part of life. It's a fact. Things have things change and come to you. It's a fact. And not everybody's gonna be loyal to you all the time. It's a fact. Amen. And things don't go according to plan. Those are just facts. So uh, things have a way of working out. So I got in there and they sent me to school. They're paying for my college now to get my master's degree. And uh, they sent me to to uh, California, pay for me to go to California and get my units of CP. Now, I got my units. Did you call something? God has a way of working out. Number four, we discover unique gifts. That's something that happened to me. When when I had that throat surgery and they had to operate on my throat, I couldn't uh, preach anymore. God gave me an opportunity to go to Bible college, and one of my Bible instructors, Kelsey Griffin, was such an impact on me. He was the best Bible teacher I ever heard. And he helped develop that inner gift of teaching in me. He gave me an opportunity to see what teaching could do. Because as a young preacher, you want to preach. You want to get up there and you want to, you, yeah, you want people running, jumping, bucking, hollering, screaming. And you want to, woo! You want to have a whole fire chandelier swinging. But, you know, God showed me that I'm not going to do that in my ministry. What I can do is teach. Yeah. So that was that inner gift that God. So we discover unique inner gifts when you learn how to say yes to the absolutes of life. Instead of getting mad, God redirects you, takes you down a different path. Amen. Yeah. 
And then that, that's something we need to understand. So there are also absolutes that apply only to us as individuals. That's our temperaments, our IQs, our, our, if we're introverted or extroverted or so forth, our spiritual gifts. God gives those to us individually. And we have to learn how to, to, uh, to groom those and to use those. Amen? There are, in, there are, in fact, absolutes in everything that we do in every place that we enter. An absolute of having a job. Now, I want to talk to you, man. Listen to me. It's important that y'all grab this because you're going to be leaders in your house and leaders in the church. This isn't just something that I'm saying. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you as men to understand your role as a man is to learn how to accept these absolutes so that your family won't be devastated every time something happens. This world is wrapping down. This world is getting worse and worse. And the only stability your kids are going to see is you as a father. An absolute of having a job. What is the absolute of having a job? Well, you might get a promotion. So that's an absolute. What's another absolute? You might get fired. So... When you get fired, what do you want? <laughs> and when you get the job, the absolutes are you might advance or you might get fired. That's an absolute. And you can deny it all you want, but guess what? That reality is not going to wait around for you. Does that make sense? Listen to me, you have to learn how to deal with situations with God on hand in your life. So an absolute of having a job is that you might advance or you might get fired as well as any other number of possibilities along the way. Like uh, at our hospital, uh, oh, corporate, corporate said, we got to have PCCs. Right? Oh, PCCs. Right? They changed the name of something. And so they sent them six months to school. They got all these ladies, and they went to school for six months, and they come, and it's been going on like about six months. And they said, oh, we're going to scrap that. And now all these ladies that had advanced up from just being a nurse don't have a job. Wow. They went from being a supervisor to nothing, no job. So now, the, well, uh, we can move y'all to Siena. We can move you to San Martín. We, their whole life has been spent at the Lima, but everything's changing. Everything's moving. Things change. And you've got to learn how to accept those absolutes. You've got to understand that absolutes are going to come. Amen? An absolute of a relationship that it may last a lifetime or it may end with the next phone call. You see... Life, everything changes and everything ends. With my life, I was in the Army in 1979. In 1979, I was on top of a table telling dirty jokes with a pocket full of money because I just black marketed some cigarettes and some booze. And I'm the life of the party. I'm the NDA, and everybody likes me only because I had money and drugs. But I was up there, I was telling the jokes, and this guy walks up, he says, hey, Danny, yeah, Top wants to see you. Top is first sergeant. He's the first sergeant wants to see you. And so I walked up that hill, and I'm going, oh, man, I'm busted. I, I, I'm going to get in trouble for selling uh, booze and selling uh, cigarettes. And, and so I'm walking up that hill, dreading to go talk to Top. And when I get in Top's office, he said, Danny, sit down. I said, what's the matter, Top? He said, well, he said, I just got a phone call. Your father died. Your father passed away this morning. And uh, I just wanted to tell you that. You know, I was just on top of the table telling dirty jokes. I was... I was the life of the party, and everybody liked Danny. Danny was, was the cool one. Danny was the one to get everybody to laugh. He was the, he was the, 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 the group, idiot of the group, you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't care what I had to do. I didn't do anything to make people laugh and everything. But all of a sudden now, one phone call, and they told me my dad died. My dad passed away. So here I am, man. The reality of life hit me. Everything changes in the ends. All of a sudden, my life changed. There was an end in a relationship. My father was no longer alive. I wasn't able to make some things right. So, man, it was hard on me because there were things that I wanted to tell my father. I wanted to ask you forgiveness for some things that I had said and done. But I wasn't able to do that because reality hit. Those absolutes are there. Those absolutes are there. And it was years. Well, seven months went by before I even cried. Before I even, well, before I really sat down in my grief. Before I really cried and, and, and gave it to God. When I surrendered everything to God. I got in church during that time. 
but I still had that bitterness. I still had that, that resentment about what happened towards people in my family that didn't call me sooner. So it took seven months before that happened. But it was about, oh, 10 years ago. I was missing my father real bad. And when I was missing him real bad, I didn't know what to do, so I just sat down. And I've written two points in my life. Two. And one that I wrote, the first one was to my father. And so I want to read that point to you because I'm telling you this was how I was able to deal with the reality of loss. And you remember, one of the absolutes of life is everything changes and comes to an end. You know, there's going to come a time when Jesus comes back for his church. That means the church age is going to come to an end. All right, all right. Yeah. If you think you've got forever to get ready, you're wrong. Right. You can be killed in a car. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you the reality of it. The reality is, the absolute is that everything changes and comes to an end. So I was bitter. So, I, you know, that, that stopped me. So my, my world was turned upside down. And about 10 years ago, I wrote this poem, and I want to share it with you. Things I learned from my dad. This is how I got past that. This is how I finally settled the issue with accepting that absolute in my life. I finally said yes to it. Through this poem, I finally got to say to my dad what I wanted to say. Because all those years, I would always go back and be disappointed that I didn't get to tell my dad something. But God touched me, and the Holy Ghost came down and gave me this poem to write to my father so that I could make that right and let go of it completely. Mm -hmm. Because everything what comes to an end and changes. Looking over my shoulder and back through the years, I was fighting to hold back my bitter tears. His words of advice and correcting hand at times seemed hard for me to understand. There were times he would say no and give me a stern look, turning the pages of my heart as if he was reading a book. And yes, there were times when I didn't get my way, so I moved out on my own to do as I may. As I started on the journey that was all about me, I lost the one thing that could help me see. Masking the pain that was hid inside, I was living my life that was full of pride. Those were my early teenage years when I was trying to deal with all those nameless fears. Laughing and partying with a few of my friends, then seeing firsthand how fast it all ends. I was told the news that my father passed away, so I sat down in my grief with nothing to say. After seven long months, then finally I cried accepting the fact that my father had died. Even though time has taken his voice from me, his words still ring true in his wisdom I now see. It was then that I realized I was no longer sad because I remembered the things I learned from my dad. Sometimes I hear his voice as I'm correcting my son and the memories of my dad for the job well done. I hope when I'm gone that my children won't be sad, but remember the things they learned from their dad. You see, there came that time that I had to say yes to that absolute that things came to me and my father and I's relationship had come to me and he passed away, he died. But it gave me a new opportunity to take what he transferred into me to transfer into my son. So our relationship didn't really die in reality. Transference came in and I was able to use what my dad taught me to teach those same, same things to my children. You see, you've got to have that ability to say yes to the absolutes that come in your life. You can get bitter and you can whine and you can cry and you can complain about loss that has happened in your life. I have an aunt whose um, son, my best friend, when we were growing up, her, was blown up at 21 years of age by a depression when he was redoing a car. And then would you know that my dad died at 46 of a, of a, a heart attack after that. Then my grandma passed away at 57 of a heart attack. And then Jason, her grandson, got hit by a car while he was trying to get something off the road. A girl was driving 80 something miles an hour and hit him and, and, and threw him hundreds of feet away and, and killed him instantly, 21 years old. Then her husband died. And then her son just passed away. And then her and my little brother died. And in the midst of all this loss, you know, she's never gotten bitter. She never, uh, other family members, they, they would talk to her. And they said, Why the, how come you still love God? How come you're not mad? How come you, you, you that's not fair that the 
<clears throat> What's one of the absolutes? Life's not fair. But she learned how to say yes. Fathers, listen to me. You have to learn how to say yes to the absolutes of life. So that when it does come, you're going to be able to explain to your family that God is the reason that you're able to continue on. Because it's not an ending. It's a beginning to something else. It's a beginning to allow God to take you on another journey. And you're going to find peace in that. You're going to find the people that influenced your life. You're going to keep influencing by how you transfer it into your future, into your life, and what God has for you. So I wanted to see this smile and she said, how could I be mad at God? He's kept his hand upon me. And she hugged me and she said, he's kept his hand upon me. And my old brother, Rick. She said, how can I be mad at God? And the only reason she wasn't mad at God is because she learned how to say yes to the absolutes. You see, Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. I found that in anything, I found that anything that crosses swords with my entitled ego. Now you listen, anything that crosses swords with my entitled ego, my pride, is a powerful source of transformation for inward growth. Anytime something comes to my life, and you know, you want to say that's not fair? Wait, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say yes to that absolute why. Because God's going to give me some inner growth. He's going, to, he's going to show me how powerful he is. He's going to give me that ability to accept what just took place and to be able to help somebody else in the midst of my dream and my loss. Because that's how God works. He wants to give me that ability. First Peter 2.20 says, For what glory is it? If when we be buffeted for your faults, if, if, if when you're doing bad, you get buffeted. God, God shuts you down in your fault. But notice what it says. But if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. In other words, even when it's not your fault, even when life's not fair, even when you planned something to go a certain way and it didn't, even though somebody wasn't always loyal to you, you're able to say yes to the absolutes of life so that God can give you that inner strength to get you through whatever you're going through to the other side. You're going to see a brand new life unfold. A life of joy, a life of peace, a life of excitement. You're not forgetting those people that you lost. But it's what you lost, what they transferred into you. And it continues on to be transferred into somebody else. That's what makes the difference. And that can only happen if you're willing to say yes to the fact that, yeah, things are going to change in you. Yes, things don't always go according to you. Yes, pain's a part of life. Yes, life's not fair. And yes, the last but not least, people are always going to be born with love. They're going to have bad days too. The five simple facts of life defy and they terrorize us. The mighty ego of self worth and pride that insist on full control. You see, I, I got a grip. But see, that's, that's why we get in trouble. When we don't learn how to say yes to those five absolutes of life, that means that we're still in control of our life. We still want to be in control. Our ego's still involved. We don't want to let go of something. And so we hold on to it. And that's what causes us to pain. That's what causes us to hurt. That's what causes us to frustration. That's what causes us to get bitter. Because we don't let go of those five absolutes. We keep letting our ego get involved with where we are going to hold on to that. And we're not going to let go of it. It's gone. Let go of it. But what's not gone is the memories. And death can't take away what the memories keep alive. You see, when, at the Panama Canal, when the ships would come through the canal, I would see how big they were. You couldn't even see the top. They'd come in and drop them through the lock. And they'd go down and they'd push them through. And they'd come back up. And they'd, shoot. they'd drift off the sea. And you know, you'd look back there and you go, Man, that ship is getting what? It's not getting smaller. It's the same size it always was. But in your memory, now it's going from the physical to the memorial. I still remember how big that ship is even though I don't see it. And when you learn how to say yes to the absolute to that, 
moms, but mostly dads, you listen, when you learn how to say yes to the absolutes of life, guess what? You're going to be able to handle the memorial of it. And not everything's going to have to be in the physical. You don't have to see everything, but you can walk by faith and not by sight. Bert, me and how to say yes to the absolutes of life. You can learn how to say yes to those absolutes. The devil will not trip you up. And in the last day when there's a great falling away, you won't be a part of that. Good. Good. When many are going to believe a lie and be damned, you won't be a part of that. You know why? Because I've learned how to say yes to the absolutes. And if I could say yes to the absolutes of life, I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. You'll have your feet on the rock. And your mind made up because I've learned how to accept the absolutes of life. Because when I do, I'm able to turn everything over to Jesus Christ. Every head bow. God, we thank you for this opportunity to study this word. I know we almost got finished for it. But God, I, I pray that these men understand what I was saying today. I pray that they sit down and they go over those five absolutes and they, they get to the place they can say yes to. Lord, yes to him in every aspect so that he can be the one that leads us and guides us. Let us get our ego, our self work, what we think we're working. Let us take that out of our hands and put it in you, God. Don't let our ego interfere with the plan that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. We're going to take a short break. We'll come back.